I should like to call your attention this evening to that portion of scripture that we read together at the beginning, which is to be found, you remember, in the Gospel according to St. John, in chapter 12, beginning at verse 20, and going on to verse 41. If you like a particular text, let us take verse 21. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. But as I'm explaining, I really want to consider the entire account with you, because it is all devoted to an explanation of uh, what happened as the result of the Greeks putting this request of theirs and their desire to see Jesus uh, to Philip, who then passed it on to Andrew, and how Andrew and Philip came to our Lord himself. Now, this is uh, a strange incident, There's something unusual about it, and something rather surprising about it. Because here we have an account of certain people coming with a request and the desire to see our Lord, but whose request was not granted. And that, I say, comes to us of necessity, who have ever read these Gospels, as a, a surprise. Because there was nothing that was so characteristic of our Lord as his readiness to receive anybody. Indeed, we have incidents here in which we are told uh, how his readiness to see people and to talk to them annoyed the disciples. They more than once tried to stop people coming to him and speaking to him. They tried, you remember, to hinder a blind man who was in that condition. They tried to stop the women that would bring their children to him. But in spite of that, he insisted upon seeing them. There was nothing more characteristic of him than his readiness to receive all and sundry. The Pharisees were very annoyed that he was always ready to receive publicans and sinners. A woman guilty of adultery, other types of women, he was always ready to receive them. Indeed, he even received a Syrophoenician woman on one occasion. He spoke kindly to a centurion, a Roman who belonged to the Roman army. And yet here, I say, we are confronted by a refusal on his part. The Greeks come desiring to see him, but he didn't see them. He didn't receive them. Now, I say here is something that should surely cause us to stop for a moment and to think and to ponder. Why did our Lord behave like this on this occasion? And very fortunately for us, he gives the answers to our question himself. And all that I have to do, therefore, is to expound to you and hold before you the reasons that were given by the Son of God himself for his refusal to see this deputation of Greeks that came with a desire to see him. Now, uh, this is surely a most important incident for us to consider. Uh, I mean by that, that it's an incident that helps us to understand the case and the position of quite a number of people in this modern world of ours. There are many people today who, because of the whole state of the world, and perhaps because of their own personal problems, are becoming interested in this Jesus. Everything else seems to have failed. So they turn to him, and they look to him. And in their way, they make their request to see him, feeling that he has something to give, feeling that perhaps he is the one who is going to help them. But in spite of that, they don't seem to get satisfaction. Nothing seems to result from their attempt to get into contact with him. They feel they're left where they were, that he's got nothing to say, that there's no deliverance, that there's no salvation. They don't get what they hoped they might have got when they came to him. Now, this incident, therefore, is of extreme value as we consider the case of all such people. What of you, my friend? What is your position? Have you met this uh, Jesus of Nazareth? Do you know him? 
Have you been blessed by him? Is he the benefactor of your soul? Can you say tonight that he's everything to you and more than everything? There have been people like you in this world, like Charles Wesley, who have been able to say quite honestly, Thou, O Christ, art all I want, more than all in thee I find. Can you say that? There are people in this book, I say, who found everything in him. There are people in the subsequent history of the church who testified to the same thing. Our hymns are full of it. Well now, can you say that? Has Christ met you? Have you met him? Has he answered your questions? Has he solved your problems? That's the matter that's before us. And there's no more urgent matter that anyone can consider in this world at this very moment than just this thing that we are considering together. Well now I say, if you haven't so known him, if you haven't found rest and satisfaction and deliverance in him, well, my dear friend, let me appeal to you above everybody else to listen uh, to this incident, to listen especially to what he himself has got to say about it all. For he gives the reasons why people don't know him and do not receive his blessing. Let's look at it. Now we must start, of course, by looking at these Greeks, the people who made the request. These are interesting people. There were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. There was a feast on, a Jewish religious feast in Jerusalem. And amongst the people who came from different parts of the world, as they did in those days, they gathered together, congregated together in Jerusalem on these great festal occasions. And here amongst the company that had come up were certain Greeks. They're very interesting people. And if we are to understand the real meaning of this incident, we must be quite clear about these Greeks. What were they? Well, they were literally Greeks. And had probably come from Greece itself. Or if not, they were Greek people who were living in other parts of the world. But here they are up at Jerusalem at a Jewish religious festival. What does this tell us? Well, we know exactly what it means... Uh, to be a Greek, and particularly in these ancient times. The thing that characterized the Greeks was their great and profound knowledge of philosophy. There's no question about this. They, as a nation, had produced the greatest philosophers that the world had ever known. It's still true to say that. Quite outstanding. That little nation, that small race of people, had thrown up these mighty philosophers, this succession of these great men, that was the first thing that characterized the life of the Greek. He was interested in thought, in life. The Greek wasn't a man who was content just to eat and drink and have a good time and not think. No, no, he wanted to know what it was all about. He wanted to understand the world. He wanted to understand life. He asked his questions. He put up his propositions. And there were different answers, and they had their schools of thought and so on. Well, now, there they were. They were full of that sort of thing. But there was another thing that characterized them, you remember, and uh, that was that uh, they worshipped a multiplicity of gods. When the Apostle Paul visited Athens, the first thing that hit him in the eye was the multiplicity of temples there. The place was literally cluttered with temples to various gods. Now, what did this mean? Well, this meant, you see, that in the last analysis, their philosophy didn't satisfy them, didn't answer all their questions. They felt there were other factors and powers they couldn't account for. And the only thing to do then was to placate them. So they built their temples to these various gods and went and worshipped them and took their offerings to them. Well, those are the two main things. There were other things we know about that characterized them. Their love of sport, their cultivation of the human frame and health and things like that. Well, now, there they are. They were Greeks. But here they are, up at Jerusalem. At a festival devoted to the worship of the God, the one God of the Jews, the Israelites. What does it mean? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? They were dissatisfied. All that their own culture had got to give them wasn't enough. They were dissatisfied with it. They were looking for something else. And they'd heard somehow or another about the teaching concerning this God of Israel 
the kind of teaching that we've got recorded in the pages of our Old Testament. They'd come to see, moreover, that this was the only true and living God. That what they'd worshipped before as gods were not gods at all, but, but the creations of their own minds and imaginations. And they had come to see and to believe the teaching of the Jews that there is only one God, the true, the only true and living God. And they had come to believe in him. They were proselytes. The proselytes of the gate, as they're sometimes called. And so it was, you see, that they had come up to the festival in Jerusalem. Now this tells us a great deal about them and their whole background. But now having come up to Jerusalem, they begin to hear about this strange new teacher called Jesus of Nazareth, who's creating such a stir, people crowding after him. They'd probably listened to him. They'd probably seen some of his miracles or else certainly had heard of them. And here was a strange new phenomenon. And they want to see him. So they make their request, sir, we would see Jesus. Now this again is surely significant. What does this tell us? Well, it tells us that even the Jews' religion didn't finally satisfy them again. There was something further. Something they needed. They didn't know what. And here was this phenomenon, this new teacher, this strange power this amazing speaker. Well, they began to wonder whether this wasn't perhaps the one they should be seeing after all. So in their lack of satisfaction, they make the request to see Jesus. Now we draw this deduction that you can even have a belief in God and still not be satisfied. There are many people like that in the world tonight. There are many people like these Greeks. They've had learning, they've had understanding, they may have dabbled with philosophy, they may have tried the cults, they've turned here, there, and everywhere, but they can't find peace, they don't know rest, they're bewildered, they're alarmed by life, and they don't know where they are. They're in difficulties personally, and they see the whole world situation as nothing but a kind of exaggeration and projection of what they are in and of themselves. They may say, that they've always believed in God and that they've got to believe in God. Well, all these things may be true of somebody listening to me at this moment. But the question is, I ask again, have you found satisfaction? Have you found rest for your soul? How are you standing up to the strain of life today? How do you look into the future? What if the end is at hand? What about it? Are you ready? Can you say that you're unafraid? Can you say that you've got understanding? Can you say that Christ has enabled you to face it all and that you can stand and say, come what may, I know whom I have believed? Now then, that's the great question. The Greeks, you see, pose all that for us. They're very representative, are they not, of a large number of men and women at this present time. I believe that it's an increasing number. I believe that the world in utter bankruptcy is beginning to turn to the Christian church, turning again in the direction of this Jesus. Is he the one who has the answer? But our Lord wouldn't see these people. That's the thing that we are confronted by. He wouldn't see them. He didn't speak to them. Why not? Why wouldn't he see them? No, that's the vital question. There's something wrong somewhere, isn't there? Well, doesn't it mean this? And this is the only answer. There were some very good reasons why he wouldn't see them. One of the main answers, indeed, I suppose the chief answer of all is the very circumstances of the hour. It was just as it were before his death. That undoubtedly is one of the main factors. But it's not the only factor. Our Lord in his discourse makes it quite clear that there was something wrong about the whole approach of these Greeks. And that's the thing that I want to expound to you this evening. Let me put it the other way around. Why is it that people who become interested in Jesus Christ, and, uh, as it were, come to him or desire to come to him and never find him, never find anything in him, Though they've been interested in Christianity, they know nothing about the comfort and the consolation. They've never really seen the truth. Why is it? What's the matter? What is the trouble? Well, now, here is the answer. 
our Lord lays down this general proposition. There are certain things which are absolutely essential before we can ever truly know him. We will never know him as our Savior and Redeemer except we conform to certain desiderata, certain conditions which he lays down here for us perfectly plainly and clearly. What are they? Well, here's the first. We must approach him in the right way and manner. Now, this question of the preliminary approach is something that I'm always emphasizing and repeating. Because clearly, if we are wrong at this very initial point of approach, how can we be right anywhere else? Therefore, let us learn negatively what we mustn't do as we approach him. There are certain things that are obvious about these Greeks. You notice how polite they were. Certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast, the same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida, of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, Sir, we're, they're polite people. These were just fishermen, but uh, they, uh, the Greeks addressed them as sir. They're very polite, they're respectful people. They observe certain niceties, their decorum is perfect. Sir, we would see Jesus. And yet there's something, even at that point, which we detect at once, is going to be a hindrance and an obstacle. They're telling us a good deal by their very demeanor and approach and politeness that uh, they've got a wrong idea about him. You see, they think of him as a great man. And a great man is to be approached in the right way. What do they call it? Protocol. Uh, you must observe the niceties. You don't rush to such a person. Find out who are his followers and who are his agents, as it were, and you, you make your polite request and it gets passed along and eventually you're hopeful that you'll be allowed into the presence of this great man. I'm not exaggerating, it's there. It's emphasized that they did approach in that particular way. What else was wrong, you think, about their approach? Well, isn't there a suggestion here? I'm sure there is. I'm certain of it. That their whole motive for seeing him wasn't, uh, wasn't right, it wasn't true. What was it? Well, I'm sure that there was a little curiosity about it. New phenomenon. Strange preacher. Someone had suddenly come right into the midst of all that had been going on for centuries. What is this? Oh, they're anxious to see it. Curiosity. And they're animated partly by that and by a general interest in him. They were intelligent people. They're Greeks, remember. And they thought, well, now we, we'd like to put a few questions to him. We'd like to know what he really is saying. It wasn't merely a question of seeing him in a physical sense because they'd probably seen him many times. To see him means have an interview with him to be able to put questions to him, and then to get his answers. In other words, don't you see here that the motive at the back of it all was, as it were, to examine him and to assess him, find out his teaching exactly, see what they thought of it. They'd got a background. Well, now then, they come to him in this way. They're very kind and polite and respectful. Yes, that's all right. But the whole time they're really coming as... Uh, Men and women who are more or less equal, they, they recognize he is outstanding, but uh, they want to question him and cross-examine him. They want to come to an assessment concerning his teaching. Uh, they want to see Jesus in order that they may be able to sum him up and see what he really has got to say, whether he can help them or not, and what they're finally to make of him. Now there I see that in all the approach of these people. Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, surely there's a great deal of this at the present time, and it's often very polite and very respectful. But this is the approach of so many to this person. There are many still who have always approached him and will approach him in the coming days as just a babe of Bethlehem. They're interested in that idyllic story. Very beautiful, they say, most Wonderful, beautiful story in the world. And they enjoy the story of the babe of Bethlehem. They like singing carols. They don't sing many hymns, but they like singing carols. 
and they do it once a year regularly. They think it's very wonderful and very beautiful. That's the approach. There's an element of patronage in it. They're looking on, on the babe. A beautiful story in an ugly world. Love in the midst of much hatred and confusion. But that's the approach of so many. Then, you see, there are those who, like these Greeks, still more definitely are interested in him only as a teacher, as a kind of reformer. What's Christ got to say? What's Jesus say? And they're interested in his teaching. They think it may help in the present predicament of the world. It may have something to say to us. So they come and examine it. Is there any good in it? Can we take it out? Can we use it? Interested in him just as the teacher, as the political reformer, and so on and so forth. Still, you see, it's the same attitude. A great man, perhaps the greatest man who's ever lived, but no more, so they come with great respect. Sir, we would see Jesus. But that's the spirit in which they come, and that's the desire that animates them. These men were undoubtedly interested in him as the Jewish Messiah. And to them he was one who claimed to be that, and they were interested in examining and in investigating that. Well, I needn't keep you. Let me ask you a simple question, my friend. What's your motive as you come to him? How do you really approach him? When you say, I would see Jesus, how do you say it? What is it that you've really got in your mind? Now then, I say that that's not the right approach. It's because that was their approach that our Lord didn't see them. What is the approach then? Well, you know, there's a wonderful answer to all this in the pages of the four Gospels. Had you noticed it? Had you noticed how the people who really were blessed by him came to him and approached him? How different. The first thing I notice about all these others is there's an absence of this protocol. This politeness and the correct approach. What you find, well, this is what you find. There he is in a house one day, seated in order to have a meal. And suddenly a poor woman, a very sinful woman at that, began to wash his feet with the tears that came pouring out of her eyes. And then she proceeded to dry them with the hair of her head. She didn't ask anybody for introduction. No, no. She was a woman, a sinner, and she had a deep need and a deep realization. Do you remember the other woman? He was in a great crowd. She just touched the hem of his garment. She didn't say, Sir, give me an introduction. You look at them, every single one of them. The publicans and sinners didn't make any request. They just pressed after him. Do you remember the men of Gadara? When he saw him, he rushed to meet him. Every person who was ever blessed by him came to him in that way. They don't seem to be as polite as these Greeks. No, no. You see, when your heart is broken and when you're conscious of your need, you forget your good manners and your politeness. You just rush to him as the only one who can save you. There's an essential difference at that very point. But our Lord, of course, emphasizes this all for us. Notice his extraordinary reply to this request. Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. That's his answer. I'm not going to see these people, he says. Why not? Well, because it's a waste of time at this point. They're all wrong in their approach and in all their ideas concerning me. They come to me as a man, as a great man, as the Jewish Messiah, as someone who can teach and help. I'm not. I'm the son of man. Son of man. Not a great man, but the son of man. He's making a unique claim. In other words, he is asserting his person and his unique deity. He uses the term glorified. This is the time the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. What does that mean? Well, he'll explain it later on. In the 17th chapter, he prays the Father, give me back, he said again, the glory which I had with thee before the foundation of the world. Glorified, again demonstrated to be the Son of God whom he is, that the glory may be again be manifest. He's been here in the flesh, and the glory is hidden. Let it be seen. The hour is come, he said, when it's about to happen when the, the declaration will be made that I am who I am. 
And then you notice in that 32nd verse, he makes this great claim. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And all men there means not every single individual in the world, it means all nations. He'd kept himself to the Jews only, and these are Greeks. And what he's saying in effect is I can't receive Greeks now, but after I've been lifted up, which means, as we are told, the manner of death which he died, namely being lifted up on a cross, crucified, then I will draw men from all the nations of the world unto me. I'm not the Jewish Messiah. I am the Savior of the world. Now that's what he's saying. So you see, our Lord lays it down in the first instance that this whole matter of approach unto him is a very important and a very vital one. If you come to him as a great man amongst other great men, you'll never know him. If you come to him just as a great teacher and no more, he'll never give you his benefits, never. It doesn't matter how polite, how correct your approach. It doesn't matter how interested, how intellectually involved you may be, it'll never help you. He is not to be approached on that level. He won't take people on that level. You try to bring him down to the level of the philosophers or the statesmen or anything else and just put him there. He won't speak to you. You'll find that he'll no more receive you than he received these Greeks. He is the son of man. You've got to realize who he is before you'll ever get any benefit from him. You can take his teaching alone, it won't help you. It's a great teaching, yes, you can add it to your philosophies, it won't save you, it'll never give you that final soul rest and satisfaction. No, no. All who've ever known his blessing have realized that he is son of God, son of man, that he's someone who's come into this world out of eternity. He's not a man amongst men, he is God in the flesh. He's the glorious one that has come out of the everlasting glory into time and has returned again to it. The Son of Man must be glorified. And he stands uniquely before us as the only one who has ever ventured to say that he is the Savior of the world. Of the whole, there is none other he is alone, none other name under him given amongst men, whereby we must be saved. Very well, there's the first thing. This matter of the initial approach is absolutely vital and essential. Come, my friend, let's be clear and practical about this. I'm not here just to preach of something that happened in the past. I'm concerned about you. Do you know him? Has he made all the difference in the world to you? Has he taken away from you the fear of death and the fear of the morrow? Do you know him? Well, start by realizing who he is. Son of God, son of man. The only savior of the world. But let's go on to the second matter. The second point that he insists upon is this, that we must believe in absolutely the necessity and the cruciality of his death upon the cross. Now this is the chief matter here. I reminded you just now that our Lord was undoubtedly influenced by the fact that this was just before his death. And so he begins to talk about that. It is absolutely essential if we are to know him as our Savior, that we believe in the absolute necessity of his death. I am not detracting from his life, his example, his teaching. It's all absolutely perfect. But he tells us himself beyond any doubt or uncertainty that his life, his example, his teaching, his everything cannot save us. There is only one thing that saves us, and that is his death upon the cross. Now, this is obviously absolutely vital and crucial to us, isn't it? It's he who says that, it isn't me. 
He says that if we're wrong here, there's no value in anything else. Listen to what he says about his death. Let me put it before you. He says, first of all, that he had come into this world in order to die. Now then, here's the season of Advent, the babe of Bethlehem. All right, if you're interested, let me ask you a question. Why did he ever come? Why did the Son of God ever come into this world? That's the crucial question. It's no use talking about Christmas. It's no use talking about the Incarnation unless you know why he came. Why did he ever enter into the virgin's womb and be born as a helpless babe? What's it for? This is his answer. He came in order to die. The hour, he says, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. I do commend to you a reading of this Gospel of John during these coming days. And watch this term, the hour. He keeps on talking about the hour. My hour is not yet come, he keeps on saying. But now he says the hour is come. What is this hour? Well, it's his death. It's the thing he's going to talk about. He has come into this world in order to die. Listen to it in verse 27 again. I've given you verse 23. Listen to 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Here he is in his agony, and he, as it were, talks to himself and says, Shall I ask God to deliver me, to save me from this death? He says, No. It was because of this and in order to do this that I came into this world. For this cause came I unto this hour. That's why he's come. That's why he's in the world at all. Now this is the teaching of the New Testament everywhere. Summed up very perfectly in the second, in this second chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. In the ninth verse we see Jesus. Made a little lower than the angels. That's the incarnation, the babe. Made a little lower than the, incarnate, uh, than the angels. What for? For the suffering of death. That's why he was made a little lower than the angels. In order that he might suffer death. Why did he come into the world? The same verse says. In order that he might, by the grace of God, taste death for every man. That babe came into the world not to live but to die. It's the whole object and purpose of his coming. He says so here. But listen to the second thing he says. He says that he can bear no fruit. He can do no good unless he dies. Here it is in verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Here's a corn of wheat, a seed. As it's there in my hand, it's no good at all. If that seed's going to bring forth fruit, you've got to bury it in the ground. It's got to die and it gives great fruit. He says, I'm like that. He's got to die before he can bear fruit. Nobody will be saved unless he dies. His teaching can't save. His example can't save. He's got to die. He's like the corn of wheat. It must die. Now, this is his own teaching. And it's absolutely crucial. You see, the Greeks know nothing about this. They come to him as a philosopher and as a, a Jewish messiah, a political leader, and they're interested. No, no, he says, I can't save you that way. I'm like the corn of wheat. I've got to die. got to be buried in the ground. I've come for that. It must happen. And then the third thing, he says in verse 32, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. I can't deal with other nations until I've died. What's this lifted up from the earth? Well, this, he said, signifying what death he should die. He says, you know, until they've nailed me on a tree and have raised up that tree, until I hang there dying, I can't draw men from all nations unto myself. But when I'm lifted up, I will draw men from all nations unto myself. Greeks then, as well as Jews, all nations, doesn't matter who they are. I am the savior of the world, but that's the way. It's the only way. If, when, I am lifted up. And it's the only way in which I can do it. Well, now, there's his statement. But says somebody, I don't understand this. Why is it that he can only save men by dying? Isn't his example enough? 
Isn't this teaching enough? If the whole world only accepted it tonight, wouldn't the whole world be transformed? I know, but the whole world can't do that, and it won't do that. If the teaching has been before them all the centuries, but they won't practice it. What's the matter? Why must he die? Here's the question. He says he must. Why? Let me give you his own answers to the question. The first thing that I find him saying is this, in verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now his death, what's just about to happen to him. His being lifted up on the cross. That, he says, is in connection with the judgment of this world. What's he mean? Why is his death absolutely essential? Oh, because of judgment. What judgment? The judgment of God. Here's the answer. The judgment of God upon sin. God hates sin. And God has said from the beginning that he will punish everyone who sins. He said to men when he put him in a perfect state in the garden, if you eat of that fruit dying, you shall die. You'll be driven out of the garden. You'll bear the consequences. That's judgment upon sin. And that is what God has announced in the Ten Commandments given through Moses in all the moral law. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. God's judgment upon sin. Here's the problem. And it is because of this that he has got to die. He says, my death is in connection with this judgment of God upon sin and evil. Now, you remember how the Apostle Paul expounds all that in writing to the Romans. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from heaven, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Why is he so proud of it for this reason? For the wrath of God is already revealed from heaven upon all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men that hold down the truth in unrighteousness. Now is the judgment of this world. Now God is going to show what he thinks of sin. God is going to show that sin is, must be punished, that his holy nature must punish it. The world is to be punished because it doesn't know God. The world is to be punished because it didn't recognize his son. When he sent him into the world, the world didn't recognize him. It rejected him. And this is the judgment that comes upon it. God is a punisher of sin. And the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon sin. That's why he must die. The second thing he says is this. Now is the prince of this world cast out. What does this mean? Well, here's another important matter for us. The world ever since men fell into sin has been in the power of the devil. Up until this very time with which we, with which we are dealing, there was only one single race and nation in the world that really believed in the only true God, and that was the Jews. All the other nations of the world believed in their various gods and demons and other things. Why? It was the devil who held them in blindness. And the Israelites hadn't discovered this themselves. It was God who revealed it to them. He'd called a man of the name of Abram and given him a revelation. He was brought up in a pagan atmosphere. God revealed himself to him. And he kept on giving this unique revelation to this people and to this people alone. The Jews, all the other nations, were held blind by Satan, who is therefore the prince of this world. And what our Lord is saying here is this, that as the result of his death, the devil will no longer be able to keep the nations of the world in this blindness and in this ignorance. And that, as you know, is something that has happened historically ever since. From this moment, the other nations begin to come to God, and they come through Christ. Never before, here the prince of this world is cast out. And he's no longer been able to hold all the nations in the blindness and the darkness and the ignorance of sin about God. 
It literally happened. Our Lord is prophesying it here. He says that by his death and resurrection, the devil will be utterly defeated. The devil will be routed. His power over nations, his power over death will come to an end. Christ, by dying and rising again, is going to bring life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now then, the two great problems facing mankind, you see, are these. The judgment of God upon sin. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. We none of us have loved God as we ought. We've none of us served him. We've all done things that are utterly reprehensible. We are all sinners. And God's wrath is upon us all by nature. We need to be delivered from the judgment of God. And then there's the power of the devil over us all by nature. The strong man armed that keepeth his goods in peace. How can we get away from him? We've tried and we've failed. There are the two problems. He says, I'm going to solve it. He says he's come into the world in order to solve it. And his way of solving it is by dying upon the cross. Well, how does he do it? How does the death of Christ achieve these two things? And he tells us here quite plainly. What does this death mean? What is this death that is so absolutely essential? Listen to him speaking. Here he cries out in a kind of agony, Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me out of this hour. What's it mean, my friend? How do you ever consider this? Do you understand it? His soul is in trouble. Not his mind only, but his soul, his innermost being. What's the matter? Why is he, as it were, shrinking from this hour, this death upon the cross? It's a terrible thing. His soul is in an agony, he says. Why? Oh, says somebody, isn't that just a natural fear of death? There's nothing wrong in being afraid of death. No, my friend, it isn't sufficient. It isn't the fear of pain. It isn't the fear of death. There have been many men in this world who have been able to smile in the face of death. They didn't shrink from pain. They didn't shrink from death. They didn't ask God to save them from it. But he does. Why? What's the explanation? And there's only one answer. This is what his death means. This is what happened. He was innocent. He'd never sinned. Nobody could charge him with anything. Well, then why does he shrink from death? I'll tell you. This is what killed him. This is the meaning of his death. He takes upon him your sins and mine. He makes himself responsible for He makes himself responsible for your guilt, for my guilt. The guilt that we have because we've sinned against God, positively and negatively. We haven't worshipped him, we haven't praised him, we haven't kept his laws. We've deliberately broken them. And we're under that wrath of God, we are guilty sinners. Now he takes that guilt upon himself. He makes himself responsible, it's on him. And he knew what it was going to mean. It meant this. That covered with your guilt and mine, he no longer is able to look into the face of his father. He is the everlasting son of God, and he'd always eternally looked into the face and into the eyes of God. There had never been anything between them. But now his sin comes, up, our sin comes upon him, and it comes between him and his father. And that's the thing he doesn't want. It's the only thing he ever asked to avoid, to be separated from his father. That's why he went through that agony in the garden and began to sweat drops of blood. That's why he cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He knew what was coming. This is the thing, the meaning of this hour. He knew that as he became responsible for our sins, the wrath of God against sin would come upon him. And he'd feel it in all its agony. He'd feel the pains of hell. Separation from God. But nevertheless, he goes on with it. He says, no, I'm not going to offer the prayer to be delivered from it. Father, glorify thy name. Thy will be done, not mine. 
he gave himself and it happened to him. And he was smitten, stricken of God. The chastisement of our peace fell upon him. And that is the meaning of his death. And you see, that is how he delivers us. He has borne God's wrath against the sin of whoever believes in him. That's your first problem, the judgment. How can you stand in the judgment? How can you stand before God in his utter indescribable holiness, clad with your guilt and the rags of your sin? How can you do it? You can't do it. The judgment of God will fall upon you and you'll die everlastingly outside the presence of God. But if you believe in the death of the Son of God for your sins, it'll all be removed. He said himself, you'll find it in the fifth chapter of this Gospel of John, in verse 24, whosoever believeth in me, he says, hath everlasting life. He's got it now. And shall not come unto death. He has already passed from judgment unto life. His death was the judgment upon your sin if you believe in him. He delivers you from the judgment of God upon the sin of the whole race. Not only that, he delivers you from the bondage and the tyranny of the devil. Because mankind is only under the bondage and the tyranny and the serfdom of the devil because it is not being blessed by God. And when man is not blessed by God, he is helpless against the devil. And before we can ever be delivered from the devil's power, we must be right with God and blessed with God. He's done it. By reconciling us to God, he at the same time delivers us from the tyranny and the bondage of the devil. That is what the Lord himself, this same person, said to the Apostle Paul, you remember, on the road to Damascus. He said, now having shown you myself and the truth, I want to send you to these people, the Jews, and to the nations, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. It's the only way. It is Christ by dying who has purchased for us the blessing of God and has delivered us out of the clutches of the Satan and hell and has transferred us into his own glorious kingdom. Oh yes, by dying upon the cross he defeated the devil. The devil thought he was clever. He thought he'd encompassed his end. He'd finished him. He worked in the minds of the Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees and the Roman governor and everybody else. If we only get rid of him, then we are conquerors. But you see, by killing him, they defeated themselves. He can't be kept in the grave. He burst us under the bands of death. He rose triumphant over the grave. And the devil is defeated in his last act. He's been bruised once and forever. And it's but a matter of time before he will be finally cast into the lake of perdition. That's why he must die. Except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. If he hadn't died in this way, he'd be nothing but a Jewish teacher, one of the great religious teachers of all times, but no more. But having died, he's Savior. He delivers from the judgment and the wrath of God against sin. He sets us free from the power and the clutches of sin and of Satan. That is the second absolute essential condition to knowing him truly. And I just say a word about the last. It is this. It is that you and I realize why he had to do all that for us. And that we trust in him and in him alone and submit ourselves completely to him. Let me just give you the headings. The first is this. If you want to know the Lord Jesus Christ as you are Savior, the first thing you've got to understand is the true nature of your life in this world as you are by nature. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Now, my friend, here's the practical matter. You see, it's all this question of why do you want to come to Christ at all? Why do you desire to see Jesus? Is it because you want to enlarge your mental outlook a little? Is it because you want a little help in your political campaign or whatever it may be? Is that it? 
Well, you might as well stay at home. You'll never know him. This is what he says. Have you seen the nature of life in this world? Have you seen it's something to be hated? Have you seen it's evil? Have you seen it's under the wrath and the condemnation of God? Have you seen that it's vile? If you haven't, you've got nothing. You must start by realizing the character of your life in this world, that it's something hateful, something utterly different from what God originally made and planned. Secondly, you've got to realize, my friend, that the one thing that matters is your soul. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If you really want to know this person as your savior, well, then you've got to realize that your big problem is the salvation of your soul, not just the preservation of your body, but the salvation of your soul. You're frightened of death. You don't want to go out of this life. You're having such a good time. You want to postpone it as long as you can. You're against war, therefore. But you're thinking of the wrong question. It's your soul. Don't you see that the value of your soul is so great that you must be ready to die, he says, rather than lose this? It's another way of saying, what shall it profit a man though he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? He says, this is how you must come. The Greeks hadn't known anything about this. They were standing on their feet with their politeness. Sir, we would see Jesus. But a woman in the depths of sin and in the gutter, no, she's lost and she clings to him. He is the only one who can cleanse me. And so with all of them. Have you come as realizing that your soul is lost, that you're a sinner, that you can't save yourself, that you're vile and that you're unclean? That's the way to come, he says, realizing the value of your immortal soul and realizing it to this extent, that rather than lose this, you'd lose everything, life itself, in order that this might be saved. Do you approach Jesus Christ like that? It's absolutely essential. Then he goes on to say that we must serve him. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Are you being honored by God? Are you a child of God? Do you know your life's in the hands of God? Oh, this is the supreme thing. There's only one way to get it. Serve Christ. Which means this, become his slave. Submit yourself to him. Stop standing up and questioning him. Stop examining him and coming to your decisions and conclusions concerning him. Fall at his feet, men. Do like the woman did in sin. Fall at his feet. Hold on to the hem of his garment. Become desperate and realize that he and he alone can save you. That he's even died in order that he might do it. Begin to take the communion, the bread and the wine, because you say, here alone can I be saved. Here alone can I save the be saved from the judgment of God and delivered from the devil. He and he alone can save me and he's done it by dying. Serve me. Submit to him. Surrender your life to him. And then go after him. Follow him. If any man serve me, let him follow me. Deny yourself, take up the cross and follow him. If you really have seen this truth, if you have seen that your soul is lost, that you don't know God, that you're under the judgment of God and that you can do nothing about it, well, then you'll not only believe that Christ died for you, the Son of God, but you'll follow him. You'll let the world laugh at you if it likes. You'll let your family even be annoyed with you. You'll say, this comes first. Yes, before my wife, my children, my husband. Here is everything. My soul, I'll go after him. I'll serve him. I'll follow him. Let him lead me where he wills. I'll even die for him rather than deny him. And you know, the first Christians did. The Roman authorities came to them and said, you mustn't say that Jesus is Lord. There's no Lord but Caesar. Say, Caesar is Lord. No, they said. If you don't say it, said the authorities, we'll throw you to the lions in the arena. Very well, they said. Do what you will with us. But we can only say this. Jesus and he alone is the Lord. He's the Savior. He's the Redeemer. He is the Lord of the universe. And I follow him, come what may, even into the very jaws of death itself. 
No, my dear friend. Ah, the three essential conditions to coming to know him as your Savior and as your Redeemer. The Greeks knew nothing about any one of them. Do you? There's only one way to know him as your Savior, Redeemer, and Lord, and to enjoy the benefits and the blessings. To be a partaker of that much fruit of which he speaks, it is this, that you just fall helplessly at his feet in the agony of your soul and say this, just as I am. Without one plea, I don't bring my learning, I don't bring my knowledge, I don't bring all the good I've ever done, I don't bring my morality, I don't bring my character, just as I am. Without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to me. O Lamb of God, I come. And if you come like that, you'll have a wonderful reception. He'll reveal his love to you. He'll give you an assurance if you ask him that he has died for you, that you've passed from judgment to life, and that he'll move you from the kingdom of Satan into his own dear kingdom, and you'll walk in his light of life until the end, and then enter finally to be with him in the glory having the Father to honor you, where I am, he says, there ye shall be also. My dear friend, learn the lesson taught us by the incident of the Greeks who came and said, Sir, we would see Jesus. Learn the lesson. Don't come in that way. Come in the way that he himself indicates and thereby be saved, and enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.